Yes, allow me first to uh, introduce myself properly <laughs> uh, without uh, superlatives, uh, too many of them at least. Uh, I'm a professor of strategic management uh, here at the Faculty of Economics and also head of the um, uh, sport management program, uh, which we run now for maybe 13 years, Claudia, correct me. Um, it all started um, with, uh, with a New Year party where there were deans of Faculty of Economics and Faculty of Sport, and uh, they were talking um, among each other. This is not present yet in Slovenia, and um, that it would be good to start something, so education of, of um, management in, in the sport sector. And um, at that time, the Dean of Faculty of Economics was Max Steinecker, and he said, he looked across the table where I was sitting, and he said, you play football, right? I said, yeah. Well, you will be in charge. So I was in charge till then, <laughs> uh, till then for, for this program. Uh, this is my contact information. Um, but now let's get to serious business. Um, so the starting point or the foundation of my today's presentation is actually a document. Um, I cannot see this on the screen, so um, I hope, um, yeah, that, you, that everything runs, uh, but I, here is blank, so, but I can see it here. Uh, so um, the, the starting point of today's presentation um, was a document prepared by EU um, called um, Expert Group uh, for Good Governance, so an EU uh, group um, um, which created a document um, discussing some principles of good governance in sport. Um, and uh, basically, it's a document with, that starts with um, the definition and uh, where it is applicable. And um, further on, it discusses 10 standards uh, that each sport organization should practice. So um, the, the definition of good governance um, is actually, it, it reads quite eclectic. It no, it's not very well organized, but, but uh, it, it does start very good. And um, the, the start is that it is a set of uh, uh, frameworks and, and cultures. So this is a culture and framework, which is a good point because um, uh, in these principles, um, the good governance rules uh, principles, uh, they actually tackle the hard things and the soft things in the organization those that can be prescribed, so the, the, you can always prescribe some frameworks, what to do, how to do, how to prepare strategic plan, and so on, and, and some things that are soft, that you cannot prescribe, and this is the culture part. Um, so we'll talk about those, um, all of them, um, in a bit different way than they are organized in this, in this document. Um, and uh, one more thing, which is very good uh, to mention, this document also uh, specifically mentions that uh, there are a number, a range of organizations uh, that uh, should pay respect to these principles and uh, they are coming from the bottom, uh, so grassroots organizations in sports, uh, all the way to international federations. Uh, of course, the more you go to professional level, uh, the more is expected, the more codes of ethics and so on should be developed, the more strategic plans should be sophisticated and so on. And the more you go to grassroots organizations, it is obviously that you, some documents will be less formal uh, and, and so on. Um, so we'll talk about um, um, 10 standards. Let's go through them very quickly because uh, after that, uh, my or, uh, presentation will be organized a little bit different, more or less about some of them only. Uh, it's not visible here, but, but I marked some of them in italic text, uh, so that's one thing that was lost. Uh, so uh, the ones that I would be more interesting to talk about, because there are about half of them where my colleague from Faculty of Sport, Matej Tushak, will be m much more an expert uh, at. Uh, so, for example, um, delegation and committees, uh, management, um, uh, clarity of purpose and objectives, the first one. These are fields that are very, very, very connected to governance and management uh, principles, and I will be glad to talk about those uh, with some examples. But there are some of them, li like, um, for example, accountability, transparency, inclusivity, youth management, and so on, that are very, very related to ethics and um, social responsibility and so on, and, um, um, and especially about ethics. Uh, this will be the second part. Uh, so after my presentation, Matej will, Matej will continue. Um, 
So if we go quickly through, the, through those standards, um, uh, by the way, uh, I will have interviews with you. you. You're familiar with that later on. Some of them today, some of them tomorrow. These uh, 10 standards are very nicely incorporated in an online tool, uh, self-assessment tool, um, with um, roughly 45 questions um, assigned into four, four sections. Uh, and um, it's one of the best tools I have seen um, so far developed for sport organizations. And uh, you will be kindly asked to <laughs> respond to those, to those questions. Um, so uh, when, you, when we go through these principles, I will not, you know, I, what I have done is I have outlined them uh, and I have uh, explained very shortly what each of them is about. Uh, for example, you know, the clarity of purpose and objectives. Every process of strategic thinking or every process, what should we do in the long range, should start with the question, uh, why are we here? Uh, who do we serve, and so on. So we need to, to, to be aware of our um, purpose of existence, which is a mission statement. Also, every organization, be it a very professional sport club uh, or, a, or a huge uh, federation, uh, and all the way down to a very recreational um, association like a sport club on a very basic level, they should be aware of that. How do, you, how, how do they see the future? How do they see where they want to be in five years, which is a mission, vision statement. Uh, only then you can start developing proper goals, strategic goals, and then, of course, only then you can develop uh, proper steps how to improve the situation. Um, other um, principles, um, I'm sure they will also get this material, so they will be able to read about it, and um, that's why I would not like to go from point to point here. Um, but if we go, just scroll through that. Um, this is a, a document that actually uh, ha have left me indecisive um, in a way that I had a bit mixed feelings. Uh, very positive side is that this document exists and that it does try to improve um, sport management. Um, in different kinds of organizations. However, um, professionally looking um, at this document, I see some problems with it. We discussed with Rock, and um, uh, he made a very good joke uh, that uh, you never doubt European Union principles, but I still do. I'm an academic, so I'm allowed to do that. I'm allowed to doubt everything. <laughs> so uh, that is my advantage, Rock, yeah. Um, what is the, in my opinion, the problem these are the rest of the, of the principle, is um, that not all, these principles are not well organized. Um, if I go back, um, there is a little bit about ethics here, and there is a little bit about ethics in, 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 let's say, in the fourth one, and so on. So the organization is one thing that I would improve in these principles. And uh, don't worry, we'll try to do that gradually for this project in, in years. Um, second thing is, um, there is a lot about what should be done uh, and uh, basically nothing about how to do it. Uh, so uh, what is missing is the, in this document are some uh, templates maybe, how to, how to do something, how to, you know, how to prepare a certain part uh, um, uh, of this process. Uh, another potential problem that I see is that this document is adapted for larger and also organizations that do not have financial problems. Uh, more or less, um, because if you want to do everything that this document requires, then um, you'd have to be really long-term focused, which means you should not have any problems from the past. Any, you know, th there is no fire that you need to dis that you need to put out first, uh, like financial problems, debts, and so on, which is quite common uh, in sport uh, organizations. And uh, <clears throat> last thing. Um, um, the document um, widely speaks about um, um, the inclusion of stakeholders um, um, and, and everything uh, which, uh, at least from the culture of this region, I mean, 
at least in Slovenia, I have this feeling that, um, you know, it's very, very difficult to get um, volunteers, proper number of volunteers that would be willing to put so much effort as these guidelines require. Um, I don't know if you read those guidelines, but in, in every second sentence, there is something that volunteers should do. Well, um, uh, if you have them very motivated in a way, then this, this is, of course, possible. But um, definitely, um, uh, as much as I know about uh, organization in sport, uh, organizations in Slovenia, uh, and uh, the culture, uh, at least in this part of the world, uh, you cannot count on volunteers that much. Um, so I see some problems, but um, definitely the document is a good one. Uh, it, it's, 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 um, it's welcome from the point of view that there is at least is something um, that, that we start with. And uh, hopefully with this project we can, we can improve um, some practices um, in sports organizations, especially in hockey. Uh, well, from the very professional point of view, uh, also um, I, I would talk more about um, governance and management principles because many of these principles actually tackle both organizational functions. I know that this is not a key point and that it's just a terminology, but uh, since we all want to learn something, uh, uh, you know, governance is linked to a specific stakeholder group and uh, the, the, the governance is always, uh, always a, an activity or a function, organizational functions that is practiced by owners, if we talk about companies, uh, for-profit organizations, or founders, if we talk about other organizations like non-for-profit. Non uh, this is a fact. So all these principles in this document, they talk about governance principles, while in fact many of them are connected with the second function, which is management. Um, so, but it's not important. I mean, it's just, a, as I said, it's just terminology. It's not, um, it's not um, the content that we, that we talk about. Um, why are good governance and management principles so important in sport? Um, well, um, there are s a number of reasons, uh, but I mentioned only one here. Uh, because uh, sport organizations um, have um, certain links, uh, certain cooperation, certain uh, um, activities that uh, actually have consequences or tackle many stakeholders. And uh, above all, um, uh, these stakeholders are those that are sometimes very vul vulnerable. And these are, this is youth and, and children and, and uh, so on. So uh, that's why it's very important that we understand proper ethical principles, that we do not overspend funds on improper things and so on and so on. Um, second reason would be also that limited budget, bu budgets do not allow you know, improper practices. So that's why we need especially uh, well-prepared plans, uh, budgets, and so on. Um, when we talk about stakeholders, uh, uh, think also for your organization, um, your federation. Uh, you're mostly the, you come from, from hockey federations, right? Uh, so even a non-profit organization like yours has many stakeholders. Uh, they could be grouped into different uh, let's say maybe three sections. There, is a, there are stakeholders um, who are involved in an organization. When I say stakeholder, I mean a group of people that, who have interest uh, and uh, have some, also some power that influence the organization and also expect something from, from the organization. So um, definitely one group are those that are um, especially uh, linked to financing the organization. So these are uh, those who, who provide permanent funds, maybe owners, founders, and so on. And on the other hand, those who provide funds for certain projects, maybe lenders of money, banks, and financial institutions. But they are not widely discussed in my presentation. Um, second group uh, would be those that are mostly linked not to financial background of organization, but the product of the organization or the service. Uh, of course, these are suppliers, but not even them, but mostly buyers. And when, when I say buyers, I mean generically buyers. Of course, in sport, I mean spectators, uh, fans, and so on. Um, and also, the, the 
stakeholder group which is mostly forgotten and uh, very neglected, uh, which is not, not proper, are host communities. Uh, just um, last week, uh, Rock and I also uh, started to discuss um, another project linked to what we'll do here as a part of this sport management program. Within this program, we also have um, a, a course titled um, uh, Research and uh, Consulting Project in a Sport Organization. And, um, you know, the host communities that are very associated with an important strategic goal of the Hockey Federation of Slovenia are muni municipalities. And how we should better work with them for example, in the improvement of the hockey infrastructure in Slovenia. Uh, because Hockey Federation has some limitations and is not willing to you know, invest their own funds and so on, which is only reasonable. But how to work now with host communities, with municipalities, with, with bigger cities. There are no bigger cities in Slovenia, by the way, but uh, those biggest, biggest ones for our standards. Uh, how to work with them to persuade them that they would do their part in establishing proper, proper uh, ice rinks and so on. And finally, the third group, uh, which are insiders mostly, um, so those who either manage the organization or are employed there, and of course, since this is sport, uh, as I mentioned, uh, many of those who work actually are not employed. They are actually volunteers. Um, so working with stakeholders, uh, is widely discussed in these 10 principles of good, good governance. Um, and now, um, uh, let's continue briefly about this stakeholder. Is this sound, sir, means that I should stop? Hopefully not. OK. Because I have a lot to talk about. <laughs> um, no, it's OK. Sorry? He's paying the beer tonight. Oh, yeah, OK. He does look like that, right? So, yeah. um, well, let me continue this story about stakeholders. <clears throat> you know, they have different power. Uh, obviously, if you go back and read them, who are they? You can see that they have different power. Uh, they are not equally influential in a sport organization. So you have uh, stakeholders that have much, much more power than others. And these are managers and, uh, and owners, or better to say, in hawk in the sport organization i should i should stop using the word owners maybe founders you know those who found the organization those so either the govern the, the the state or the municipality or whatever um if we take this um just a little bit into um let's say academic world we w we, we would talk about a classical principles principal agency problem because when you add to the power the fact that stakeholders also are only human and that they would be motivated to also act in their own best interest. So um, maybe a good word, Matei, would be opportunistically. Yeah? Uh, when you add those two things together, you get a classical problem, which is a basic part of the principal agent theory. But in business, in for-profit organization, this is a very different problem because in, 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 in a classical corporation, company, what you have is a major problem between agents and principals. Agents are managers, those who are employed in an organization, and principals are those who own the organizations and hire managers to take decisions for them. So they are obviously expecting that these decision, decisions are made in the best interest of the owner because they hire managers. Um, but agents, slash managers, they have also their own interest, their best interest. So how is this typically seen in, in a corporation? Is for example, that manager accepts two risky decisions. Uh, so the decision that would uh, maybe create risk, that, and that this risk exceeds the potential returns. Uh, why would managers do that? Well, because why, once the organization grows, their benefits grow. On the other hand, even principals somehow misbehave. 
uh, although they own or, or you know, they have founded the organization, sometimes they behave very speculatively. So especially the owners who are only, uh, who only buy shares of, of a corporation, they have very short-term goals sometimes. They would expect returns, they would be willing to invest money today, but expect returns yesterday, which is not possible. And this short-term basically does not allow managers to do their job properly. Um, even in sport, we have this short-term pressure for results and so on. So it's quite similar. But in sport, okay, so this was a brief, brief intermezzo of what is this theory about. But in sport, we have commonly a different situation that <clears throat> principals and agents actually work together because sometimes in sport, principals and agents are very interconnected and it's difficult to put a line, a clear line. Where is the, where is the, the, the the line between management and governance. It's very difficult to define sometimes in sports. Uh, so they commonly work together and since they also are sometimes opportunistic and have power because they have the most power to, in, in, in the whole set of, uh, of stakeholders, uh, it is something that is uh, in a new literature about sports management uh, called uh, confluence problem. Um, and this confluence is actually <clears throat> working well where the powerful stakeholders have um, about the same level of information. So, and when they can very clearly expect what the results would be of their misbehavior. So if they have clear calculation how much this would bring them. Now I'm talking also about unethical things and, and so on, uh, but, but, but nevertheless it is about management here. Uh, a clear case about this would be uh, what happened in FIFA, you know, in, in not just in uh, the last three, four years uh, r with regard to bribery uh, scandal, uh, but also many other things like um, what happened um, with the Vice President uh, Jack Werner uh, and uh, his supposedly how he profited from resale of tickets for the World Cup. That was in 2006, I believe, already. So the problem started very early and, were, and, and have exploded basically in the last, uh, in the last mandate um, with um, Seth Blatter and so on. So, uh, and now we have two World Cups that, are, that have this great, great, gray shadow hanging over them, both Russia and Qatar. Um, there were multiple problems, not just, you know, a history of ethical lapses, but also even when they were somehow, um, um, when this was not tacit, when, when, when they, when this was quite explicit problem already, they, uh, there was still resistance to, to, to be transparent. Um, for example, I have put out um, an example how um, this um, um, US attorney, he was called, um, yeah, Mich Michael Garcia. This was an attorney from, from uh, New York, uh, who was actually in charge of the FIFA's um, ethical committee. He, they prepared in the ethical committee a very clear report, uh, warning about many problems. But this report was um, postponed to be published until after the new FIFA elections. And even then, after that, it continued. Uh, it continued in a way that um, basically the executive committee accused the ethical committee of being unethical uh, because of some comments were made public uh, instead of keeping them in-house. Um, so, you know, here in step two, we, we could call this a mistake. We could call this uh, improper behavior. But further on, uh, you know, it, it continued with very clear purpose not to change you know, failure not to change. Um, so uh, there were independent governance bodies who proposed 59 different recommendations how to improve governance in FIFA. 59, seven or six or seven of them were implemented only uh, in some years after that. Um, and, um, you know, if nothing else helps, then at the end, usually, usually, which is a good thing, what helps is public pressure. <clears throat> 
So what happened in the end, and the public pressure was so strong, was so, was so, um, um, so negative uh, for, for FIFA officials that uh, eventually made them, made, made them go away. <laughs> And uh, it started, for example, with a, with a well-known satirist, John Oliver, um, who, who's, uh, I don't know if you saw the video on YouTube, it had more than 10 million uh, views. Uh, but he called, um, um, he said that um, um, a hairless bear would do less damage to an, any organization uh, compared to Seth Blatter, <laughs> which is a very direct offense uh, to, a, to, a, to a high official of certain organization which is so powerful as FIFA. Um, and then also transparency, transparency international uh, pressure was so strong and so on. So we know how, we, how it ended. Uh, on the other hand, we have a very good case, um, and I'm happy that some of my cases from, for, of good governance are from hockey. Um, another, a, a completely different example uh, would be um, um, Hockey Alberta, which, it's a partial organization from Canada. Um, so uh, obviously they have um, these federations or actually associations also organized uh, within um, uh, states. Uh, and um, what I liked here in this case, by the way, you'll be given all these materials, you'll be able to read them. Uh, but we can, we can actually go through them, uh, s some of good practices here. And uh, what I liked mostly, besides you know, that they have clearly defined objectives, uh, and that they uh, have very, very good examples of what is unacceptable. And they have put this in documents and published them online and made them public. Um, uh, and besides that they have well-developed um, uh, procedures, how to handle complaints and so on, what I like most is that their document includes um, very good templates, examples of um, different things, uh, platforms and so on. So I chose three to show you. Uh, Rock, now I count on you that this works. Um, it does. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So um, one is, uh, for example, um, um, separate codes of conduct uh, for different stakeholder groups, for parents, for officials, for players, and so on. And uh, they, they uh, you know, even an organization that uh, is uh, not on a nation level, uh, it, it's smaller, but I was very surprised how well they have developed this. Uh, for example, each parent uh, is supposed to read and write and, and, and sign a document that um, is giving them some rules how they are expected to behave. Uh, you know, I said I'm coming from football. Um, uh, my son is not in football. My son is a karate. Uh, karateist, and I, if I may brag a little bit, also was a state champion last year. Um, but um, I, I go to some games, uh, if it's sunny on Sunday, for example, and um, you know, we do attend some games, even when children play. I, I would be embarrassed to sit among parents who scream at officials and so on, and throw things and um, the, only thing I, I, the only thing I can think of would be, come on, they are just children, they are 10 year old. You know, and now you're screaming at officials who are there voluntarily and so on. So a good thing maybe to, to, to think about, yeah. Um, sure. I agree to abide. Yeah, so, you know, basically what you, are you trying to warn me about something? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Ah, okay. Yeah, 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 definitely, but it's good to have this. Yeah. Um, another one would be um, for players, you know, basic rules. See, and uh, then the third one for coaches. Uh, of course, this is all for children hockey, yeah? but. Hey, that, that's what we need. And also for officials. Um, so uh, this is one thing that I liked very much. Uh, so specific documents showing what we can do specifically for different stakeholder group, how we can improve our management and, and, and um, governance practices. 
Um, maybe just escape. Rock, what happens? All tabs, okay. Um, another thing, um, or two more things that I that are coming from the same document. By the way, the document is not very long; it's about uh, what ten pages, uh, but it does include many important things uh, that we talk about today. Is um, discipline discipline gui discipline guidelines. Um, showing, uh, you know, uh, basically what happens if the offense is basic one or moderate or strong? What kind of sanctions do we try to uh, impose in each case? Now, well, that's another very practical example of what can be done uh, to move one step closer to more ethical and so on behavior. Um, and the first thing uh, which um, you'll be able to read about uh, in this document was um, something that um, in Slovenia is not so present than in some other countries. I'm not sure about how it is in, in, in some other regions, of, uh, but I would, assumingly, that the cultures are quite different, uh, qu quite similar still uh, with uh, maybe Croatian, Serbian, and so, so on federation, that they also do not have this. Uh, for example, and this is the um, uh, abuse and harassment policy. Uh, you know, this is much more present in Western Europe, uh, and almost every organization has this. Uh, maybe, maybe our Finnish and Austrian friends can, can share, share their practices about this uh, later on when we have a discussion uh, time. Um, so how not to harass uh, and how not to abuse and neglect others. Uh, so basically how to behave um, in a proper way. Um, Okay, uh, in the second, uh, how much time, Rob, do I have? When, when should I stop? I have 15 minutes, okay. Um, so, so uh, in the second part of my presentation, I would like to talk about, about the, mostly about standard six in this uh, good governance principles of EU. Uh, and this is called management. Um, so how to do good management. Um, let me start with, um, Maybe a question, <laughs> why do we need managers? Uh, well, uh, basically, the management is needed because you have more than one person completing the whole task of the organization. So uh, this means that the work is technically divided. You have different people responsible for different, different parts of the process, and you need somebody to put all the parts together. Uh, and the, 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 the essence of what managers should do uh, is basically can be described just in three words. So if nobody, if, if so, somebody asks you that does, that has no knowledge about management, what do managers do? You can just tell them three words and you would quite nicely describe the essence of what managers do. And this is coordination because they coordinate the work of others, delegation and decision making. Um, so delegation is because of course the complete task is uh, accomplished with the help of others. So managers are not there to work, to do it, to do it, I mean, they are there to work, but not physically. I mean, they, they are not there to do everything by themselves, yeah? So that's why delegation and decision making. By the way, just an, as an interesting point, uh, there are studies measuring how many uh, um, decisions an average manager does per day. These are studies in companies, not in sport organizations. Uh, would you dare to guess? A lot is, is, is a lot is not non-metric var, var, var. A day per day, yeah. Uh. No, no, per day, per, no, no. Yeah, uh, so you were both close, uh, 40, about 40 decisions per day, an average measure. Don't ask me about the methodology, how they measure that. But I'm, I'm sure that these decisions were not about which coffee I'm gonna drink. Not all of them, not all of them were strategic. Yeah, not all of them were strategic. So not all of, the, or not all of these decisions are about investments, um, choosing a strategy, but they are seriously daily or strategic decisions 
in a sport organization, which is a lot. So the essence of what managers actually do is also connected with decision making. Um, but not everything in, in um, as I mentioned, uh, in this decision making and in what managers do is strategic. So what is strategic, sorry, uh, not, uh, what is strategic in, in the management? Because these principles that we talk about, how to improve governance and management, they do actually talk about how to improve things strategically on long run. Long run. So how do we, how do, what, what is different? What is strategic versus what is not strategic? Uh, I would uh, maybe uh, just quickly go through that so that you understand when I say strategic solution and whatever. Uh, so strategic basically has in management um, is an adjective that would mean that something is vitally important. So if you make a poor strategic decision, this can lead to, lead to bankruptcy, for example. Is of holistic importance. So it, it's something that tackles more or less the whole organization. It's not some local problem in somewhere in the basement, uh, I don't know, in accounting office. Yeah? Uh, and third is of relatively permanent importance. So strategic problems, unfortunately, do not disappear overnight. So if you have strategic problems, usually you will have them tomorrow and the day after and the day after, and they will not disappear until you solve them. Um, second thing which is very important is that when you do strategic decisions, you keep in mind that it's more important to do right things than to do things right. Because if you do a perfect strategy um, in a bit awkward way, it's still less problematic than if you, if you execute a very poor strategy in a perfect way. Um, there is the third thing also, but it's mostly connected with, with profit, profit organizations. And this is associated with um, um, that the essence of every strategic decision should be to, to create strategic competitiveness. It's, you know, in sport we have uh, very different um, levels of sport and sometimes it's profit organization in sport, sometimes it's not. So this third one is, is questionable. Um, so what is now the essence of management in sport? So now I started with, with general things, what is important in management and so on, but in sport organization, um, well, first of all, majority of sport organizations are not, not non-profit organizations, or sometimes they're called also non-for-profit organizations. Um, and this creates immediately certain consequences. One is, um, um, so, you know, the basics of, of non-profit organization is that it, it, it's not that they are not allowed to create profits. It's not that they are not allowed to have surpluses of revenue over costs. Um, it's just how they are allowed to spend it. And non from non-profit organizations, uh, they are expected that they invest the surpluses into further activities, into improvement, into growth. Uh, but this immediately has consequences also on other things. For example, how do we measure performance, because in sport organization, we cannot measure performance in the same way as in companies. Uh, so what is clearly here is that uh, we'll need to measure uh, performance in different ways, like how many services do we offer, how, what is the value of these services for our stakeholders, and so on, so on. Um, so I uh, also prepared um, what distinguishes most good management uh, in a sport organization um, from any other organization. So what is so typical for management in a sport organization? And um, I came up with five such issues. Uh, one thing is um, um, nonprofit sector is growing. Not all years in absolute sense, but relatively. If you compare the the growth of non-profit sector and the profit sector, the growth of non-profit sector is faster. And uh, this creates consequences for financial needs because non-profit sector is financed from the profit sector. And um, so this creates additional problems. And you know, today when I talk to my colleagues, okay, do we have, uh, when, for example, when we try to organize a conference, yeah, let's try to contact who would sponsor us. 
the number of conferences, the number of nonprofit organizations is growing. And everybody would try to get a part, uh, some donation, small donation from the profit sector. We need to be aware of that, that there are many of us who have similar wishes from companies. And today, I mean, my career is only 20 years long, but I can, I can feel the change. You know, organizing a conference 15 years ago or organizing a conference today, or running an association today and running an association 15 years ago is a huge difference uh, in terms of how easily or difficult it is to collect financial resources. Um, second thing, um, in sport organizations, you are expected that decisions are made with, um, uh, I jumped now to the, to the um, some other, not so the fourth one, that the decisions are made collectively in a, in a wide consensus. What I skipped was um, that you have many different stakeholders that you affect. So maybe a sport organization, you know, uh, has even greater number of stakeholders who um, have direct or indirect consequences, um, or feel the, the direct or and indirect consequences of how these sport organizations behave. Um, uh, another important thing is that we need to always seek the balance of at least three things, which is not so common in, in, in a for-profit organization. But in a sport organization, you always have to have some kind of a balance between three sets of goals. This is, by the way, um, sustainability model applied to a sport organization. We need to be aware that sport-related goals are one section of goals. But there are also social goals the goals that we need to be aware of, that we are you know, part of a host community, that we need to be responsible to them as well. And also goals related to economics. Because you know, in sport organization, there is always a question, should we also try to increase the level of revenues more than cost and so on, and how, how do we use them and so on. So we, we do need to talk about the, the let's say, an equilibrium of three sets of goals. And this is quite typical for sports organizations. Y you do not have this kind of situation in, in a regular company. Um, but two things remain the same uh, from the strategic point of view, remain the same as they are in, in a company. Even a sport organization should have um, two major steps, two major parts of the process of strategic management uh, properly defined. And these are that you first need to properly formulate your strategy. And second, once you formulate your strategy, you need to implement it. And not in this event, not yesterday, today, and tomorrow, but through these years of this project. Uh, my personal goal would be, I mean, I would be very happy at the end, uh, in December of two 2021, right? Yeah, that you would, you know, say to me, uh, Tomáš, we have a much better strategic overview of what we want to achieve. Now, only if you only achieve this, I would be very happy. Um, but to do this, uh, we should not behave much different uh, than, than actually any any company. So these two things, um, I will just skip one model because it's more adapted to, to corporations, but I will go directly to a model, uh, you know, how I would suggest you start thinking about your strategic process. Um, it's called Bryson's model. Um, and uh, this is basically uh, something that we also talk during the interviews. What stage you're in, I mean, what do you have so far? Where do you feel are your disadvantages, where do, what do you feel are your things that you need to improve most and so on. So this is the, what the interviews will be all about uh, today, today evening and tomorrow morning. Um, and um, you know, this process starts with uh, similar things, but they're organized in a bit different way uh, 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 as in company, but they start with certain agreements, mission statement and, and everything you know, in the holistic analysis, how do we analyze the environment? How do we analyze the internal part of the organization? This all remains the same as in company. Just some, some spe special things are there, you know, that 
for example, we need a strong initial agreement. Who is responsible for what? Because in a company, you don't need such an agreement. In a company, you exactly know the board is responsible for this, uh, and, and the, the CEO is responsible for this. You have this clearly defined. In a sport organization, maybe it's not so clear. So you need this initial agreement. And some other things are different. For example, what do you analyze internally and what do you analyze externally? But the rest of the process is the same. You need to prepare a strategy, of course, after you have strategic goals, and then you need to start implementing it. Um, a mission statement is very important, and um, I will now use this opportunity just to show another example, which is, by the way, at the end of this presentation, uh, of something that is um, New Zealand Ice Hockey Federation, what they have prepared. Uh, it's not a document that is perfectly structured. It's also part of the materials you will get. Uh, but I, when I saw the statement of their, of their mission, I decided immediately that I will use this statement as an example for my lectures for students. Um, more fit in stakes. You know, a mission statement should say, why do we exist? What is the purpose of our existence? Have you ever asked yourselves about why do you exist? So why we were sent to this world? Yeah? Uh, sorry? Still don't know. Okay. Uh, so, you know, when you answer this question, you will get a mission statement. Um, and one of the best I have seen so far, truly, I was so impressed with that, is how they have defined their mission statement. More feet in stakes. Uh, skates. Doesn't it sound good? It's catchy. It, it clearly shows the orientation that they, they focus very much on the youth. Um, and, and so on. So the rest of the document is missing many parts, so it's not perfect. Uh, um, uh, but, but also, they, they have, they start well with priorities, and then they, after priorities in general, they talk about strategic priorities, even more important, critical priorities. And um, then, then they decide to go uh, directly to national team and so on. So they are missing some parts here, like strategic goals and so on. But, uh, the start of the document is, is very, very good. Um, um, I just have another example to finish. Um, another good, a, go, a very good case of, of governance and management um, document um, would be from British Columbia hockey. Obviously, in Canada, they know what they do. What they, what they are doing, uh, because we have two examples from, from Canadian hockey. Um, so uh, this document here is um, uh, actually prepared in a single picture, but I have broken it down into three parts uh, so that it's more visible. Um, they have prepared a document uh, which they call it uh, strategic goals and, and, and tasks, something like that. Uh, so they use, they, they almost call it a strategy. It's not yet a strategy. Some parts are missing. But what is good is that it is very, very well organized and it is very understandable because it's well organized. Uh, what, they, what they did is they have um, created three pillars of focus. Um, so one is associated with growth and communications. So what do we need to do to grow and communicate better? And what they defined was their goals. And if you look at these goals, some of them are understandable, some of, them, some of them are not. I'm pretty sure that this is just an external document they use and that they, I mean, that's usually how it's done and that for internal purposes, you have these goals better and more clearly defined. Um, and even more importantly, they continue with, with the measure that need to be taken so that we actually reach this goal. Um, and they do that for the three pillars. The first one was growth and communications. The second one was governance and finance. So what do we need to improve in our finance, financial, you know, um, to, to perform better and so on? And the third one, uh, more or less associated to sports, to the game. Yeah? Um,
should I read this now? <laughs> uh, there's a disclaimer that the rock added uh, to, to my presentation. Um, he said that it must be there. So at the end, just a big thank you for, for, for <laughs>